I'd like to welcome everyone to this Town of Richmond Planning Commission meeting for May 1st, 2024. We looks, looks like we have a couple of guests and we have our four member quorum. So hopefully others will show up as we go along. Okay, so we'll we have a busy schedule. So hopefully we can move right along important things pending all the way through. So uh, we'd like to look at the agenda, which consists mostly of two items, the residential village residential neighborhoods is first, and then um, Buttermilk Jolina Court is second on the agenda, hopefully about half and half of our time for each. Anybody have anything they want to add to the agenda? <clears throat> Okay, not hearing anything, we will proceed with the agenda as posted. All right, and we're going to look at the next, um, we'll have public comment on anything that's not on the agenda. So is anyone here as a guest for to make comments on any other matter that we might be concerned about? Okay, not hearing any, not seeing any hands. Uh, we'll move on to our next item, which is number four on our agenda. Review the minutes of our uh, April 17th planning commission meeting. Anyone want to make any additions, corrections, comments to those meetings? Okay, not hearing any, not seeing any hands. We will accept those minutes into the record as written. All right, great. So we can move right along to our first item. Um, we're hoping very soon to be able to set the public hearing for these village residential neighborhoods. And we went through most of the neighborhoods uh, in there their new format um, last time. And the copy that you have today is has got the items that had been in red, most of them went to black, meaning that nobody had negative comments to say about them. They were accepted. There were there are a few items that remain in red. And we are going to talk about these supporting documents first because they relate to the items in red. And then hopefully we'll get those kind of out of the way. And then we'll once more review the um, districts themselves, what we have for the districts, once we sort of understand the um, these supporting documents that need to go in to clarify what it is we're doing. So the first one is the elder care facility. And if you remember, we had elder care facility listed as a conditional use for both of these districts. And what we had thought about having before was having supported housing. People felt that was maybe too broad, the supported housing definition. So we created an elder care facility definition to whittle it down to um, the kinds of facilities that we thought might not require too much oversight by the town. Um, there will be some, obviously, but in the planning literature, obviously, these kinds of things, the nursing home assisted living, um, hospice, those, it's desirable to locate them in neighborhoods where families can visit and so on. So what this involves is this new definition, elder care facility that you see here on this sheet. And obviously we have to run it by the legal people to make sure that that's fine. Um, supported housing, we uh, kept as the broad category for any kind of group housing that has where the residents are assisted in some form. So 
elder care facility is a kind of supported housing. Um, and in looking through the statutes, there are some other terms that we didn't have at all in our document, therapeutic community residence, residential care home, those things are included in this list of the types of supported housings that uh, are out there. There are a lot of scattered statutory references to these things. The group home is the one that has to be permitted statutorily wherever single family homes are permitted. And also in the new, newer versions, of section of 24 VSA, section 4414, um, a recovery residence is also included in this group, uh, like a group home. It has to be permitted where a single family home is permitted. Uh, that was not previously in 4414 as a required use, but it is currently so. And a recovery residence is defined here, it's taken straight from the statute, uh, which is like a group home, up to eight residents um, supporting persons recovering from a substance use disorder. So, Virginia, is that number of eight residents uh, also statutory? That is statutory. And I think if you go down further, Keith, you will find I put the statutory references here. Keep going down. Um, so, yeah, OK. Let's see, go up a little bit. Um, so this section here, can you go to a little bit higher? just to get the title to this section. Okay, that's a group home. So, or a recovery resident serving not more than eight persons. So, like a group home, a recovery residence is only a permitted by right use if it serves not more than eight residents. And now, if we scroll down a little bit further, you can see in the last paragraph, it also, it has to be certified by an organization approved by the Department of Health. And um, scrolling down even further, it does not include, it, it is considered to be a disability, recovering from substance abuse. Yeah. So disability, the definition of that, does not include people who are going to be violent. So if you scroll down a little bit further, the term physical or mental impairment, an individual with a disability, the last sentence, does not include any individual with a substance use disorder who by reason of current alcohol or drug use constitutes a direct threat to property or the safety of others. So in other words, you can permit a recovery residence up to eight people. They're considered to have a disability, but if there are people there who constitute a threat, <laughs> I don't know exactly what the procedure would be, but they are not allowed to be there. So whether the, the home would need to remove those people from their home or exactly what would happen. But, um, you know, it's kind of a statement, I believe, that is trying to protect communities from um, any kind of individuals who have a problem enough such that they're threatening others or violent. Yeah, and, and I would add that, you know, the, the number two in this, the it's a certified by an organization approved by the Department of Health. I mean, it's incumbent upon that organization to vet those people also. And I imagine if for some reason somebody does get violent, that you would, you would um, you know, there'd be a complaint and there'd be some type of process you'd have to go through. Yeah, and those people would be involved. You know, the people who are licensing the home would be, would have to be involved and um, it would more be more than just the town dealing with that issue. Right. Yep. 
So, uh, Chris, you have a comment. Um, I like this. Um, I guess my only question is, and this is as a non-lawyer, is this legally defensible under the Americans with Disabilities Act? I just am not quite sure how mental impairment or even drug addiction is defined and whether that's considered to be an, an illness that would be protected. Well, if it's not, then our statutes in Vermont are in conflict with the ADA. So I would hope that this 9 VSA 4501 and anything that flows from that that the legislators would have checked to make sure that that was not in conflict with the ADA. I don't know. I mean, well, I guess yeah, we're obliged to follow point. the Vermont statutes. So if it's yeah, being what? pulled from the Vermont statute, it seems like it would be pretty safe. Yeah. This 9 VSA 4501 is the Vermont statutes. And what's above it is also the Vermont statutes. These are kind of interlocking a lot of these statutes. You, you know, it requires a lot of going deeper to other statutes <laughs> mm -hmm. to find out what they're actually saying. But anyway, you know, we will submit this to the, to our legal, to our legal people and, um, you know, I contemplated putting more of the statute into our regulations, but it seems like there's a lot <laughs> that would have to be put in if you put all of this information into our regulations. So I just referenced the statutes. And hopefully, if someone came to our zoning administrator and said, I want to set up this recovery residence, then all of these points would be looked into and whether it was licensed and, you know, all those kinds of things. Well, we would certainly rely on the applicant for that. Um, they would have to be certified in order to be able to do that. So, yeah, that would be an interesting process for sure. Yeah. So, any questions about this? Is this what people want to at least try to do, we'll run it by the legal people and see if they think, you know, basically it's allowing these elder care. We, and in the, in the South, the Vermont, I mean, the um, village residential neighborhood South, we already have Sterling House, which would classify. And we also have um, Richmond Terrace, which I'm not sure exactly how that was permitted, but it's apartments, but it is for elderly and disabled. So, um, you know, it would be difficult to exclude these kinds of places um, from certainly the village neighborhood south. The other thing that is important here is that in Act 47, they make up this new category of thing called an emergency shelter which is this definition from Act 47, and it is not what we traditionally think of, or I don't, as an emergency shelter, but they have defined it in this way. However, it comes, it is not regulated by um, the zoning like other municipal facilities, schools, churches, hazardous waste, sites, um, those kinds of things are only regulatable to a certain extent by our zoning. However, one of the ways that you can regulate them, according to the statute, is by location. So in this case, we are not including emergency shelters in these two neighborhoods. Now, at some future point, we will have to decide, we will have to have one of these, at least one of these, somewhere in Richmond. So we're going to have to decide where that is going to be. But 
since you can, we have <laughs> been advised that regulating it according to location includes not allowing it in certain districts. We have elected not to have it in this district. So that's up for conversation if anybody wants to talk about that. These are pretty small districts. Uh, I don't know. It seemed like it might be suitable somewhere else. You know, we, I mean, we need this, obviously, like many other things we need. The question is, do we need it here in this spot? So anyway, so that definition, emergency shelter, should be placed, however, in our Section 7 definitions. That's one of the Act 47 amendments that we need to make, is to have this definition there. And then at some point, this will appear under a list of uses like schools and churches and public institutions. It will appear somewhere in some one of our zoning districts. Anyone have any thoughts about that? All right. Okay, so is there anything on this page that anyone has concerns about or any of these the wording of these definitions and the occurrence of the phrase elder care facility in the uses table for both of these residential neighborhoods. Anybody have concerns or need more information or Chris? Um, just a, a question, I guess, about emergency shelter. I think we being thrown a little bit by the word emergency. So this is not meant to cover um like a uh, uh, shelter for people who are displaced by a um uh, a, a disaster right this is for chronic homelessness or this is for exactly what it says there and no it's not for people who are you know temporarily i mean i guess in a way if it's a specific population of the homeless. But, you know, I mean, the way we usually have normally have thought about emergency shelters is like the school, it can be if people lose power. Right. You know, if right. there's an ice storm, people lose power. So are those people temporarily homeless? Are we considering them temporarily homeless? This seems like it relates to something else. And, you know, it is possible that we need more information about emergency shelters uh, if it includes the things that we've traditionally considered emergency shelters like for people who are flooded out who are powered out whatever uh, I, mean, I, I would add that it, it would encompass that would that be something that we'd have to take on a on a case-by-case -case basis just reading it here i mean the primary purpose of which is to provide a temporary shelter for the homeless in general okay that's pretty broad and then for specific populations of the homeless and i think that's what what chris is alluding to mm. that does not require occupants to sign at least i think it covers both to be honest with you mm -hmm. yeah so i think the question for us right now is is there any place in these two districts that would be suitable for that use do we want to allow for a shelter oh. the schools are not in this district they're in the high density residential district mm -hmm. so those are the places that have traditionally been used and could potentially fit into this category I couldn't think of any place in either of the north or the south residential district that seemed like it had room for this use or any existing structures. Ian? Um, without clarification about what actually this means, um, I'd be reluctant to include this in a heavily settled residential area. 
Mm -hmm. And in fact, if we're not going to include it in either of these districts, we don't have to put it right now into our definitions section, section, if we, section seven, you know, if we don't think we know what it means, we don't have to include if we don't include it in these districts and we don't put it in our definitions you know we it's it will be on our list of all the other things that we have to do to incorporate act 47 but uh, so do we have to take a vote on something like that or a, like a straw poll or a well i mean we can at some point i would like to have a vote on whether this is ready to go in but is there anyone who disagrees with the point of not putting it in either of these residential neighborhoods? Is there anyone who would like to put it into these neighborhoods? So of the quorum that we have, nobody wants to put it into these districts. So I am OK taking that as that we're not going to put it into these districts and moving ahead with the districts without it in it. Yes. So um, I kind of don't want it to hold it up, hold us up. Nope, let's keep moving. So I think that's your straw poll, Ian, is that everybody's okay with not having that in these residential neighborhoods. Right. All right. So that's that. The second item B is the on-ground improvements. So currently in our zoning document, there is an ambiguity as to whether parking areas and driveways are structures or are not structures, which influences whether the setbacks relate to them and the lot coverage. So what we've done here is we've given them a category of their own so that they can be talked about not as structures. So on ground improvements. First of all, they're impervious. And secondly, they're man-made impervious. In other words, a slab of rock on the ground or a piece of ledge is an impervious surface, but it is not a man-made impervious surface. It does not let water penetrate it, but it's not man-made. So an on-ground improvement is a man-made impervious surface, such as a driveway, parking area, sidewalk, walkway, or patio. A structure and part of the problem with this is our definition and many other zoning ordinances, by the way, call a structure an assembly of materials for occupancy or use, which could be virtually anything, right? That's an assembly of materials for use. Well, that could be a driveway. So we are specifically removing driveways and flat things on the ground out of the category of structures. So we've modified the current definition that we have, structure, to talk about structures not including on-ground improvements, not including underground improvements, which is already mentioned the way it's written now, but including both above-ground pools and in-ground pools. They are considered to be structures. So an in-ground pool is not an on-ground improvement. So we have three categories of things, under the ground, on the ground, flat, or structures. Lot coverage is the, the portion of the ground of a lot that is covered both by structures and by on-ground improvements. So lot coverage, it includes driveways, parking areas, those impervious surfaces and structures, both on ground and structures. The setback, which traditionally has not included driveways and parking areas, is amended. Our definition of setback 
is relates only to building or structures. It does not relate to on-ground improvements. So um, it's any portion of the building relative to the lot line. It is not mentioning on-ground structures, so it does not include those. And then we have impervious surface, which we have just beefed up a little bit, a surface from which precipitation runs off, including but not limited to roofs, those are structures, but paved or unpaved roads, driveways, sidewalks, walkways, those are the on-ground improvements. So that those items just clarify what we mean and they would apply you know throughout the ordinance eventually that we have separated out um, on ground from structures the item at the bottom we can either not talk about at all the trail this has been a problem a confusing problem but we haven't really talked about it yeah. with all the people who probably need to be talked about with trails so um i think we can just omit that if people are ready to omit it it would clear up some things but it's you know probably needs a little more vetting if we're going to put it in that's a whole kind of new concept the others are really old concepts but we've just clarified the driveways and parking areas aren't structures. Any questions about that or anybody want to do yeah, something else? Do we have else? any zoning associated with trail? I mean, this definition is 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 new, but uh, I mean, do we have any reference to it anywhere in our regs? Well, Tyler mostly considers trails to be structures. <laughs> okay, we should probably eliminate that. So you know it's a structure if it has like a bridge on it or something yeah but there are i found some differences in the literature between trails that are just like okay you've cleaned the vegetation away you know like the river shore trail there's nothing that's been done to it except it's been walked on a lot and it's a path and there's no vegetation on it that's a natural trail which might want we might want to treat differently, for instance, from an eight foot wide paved or gravel trail, you know, which could be called a trail, like rails to trails. They're all those are more, it's more necessary to have a permitting process for them. But do we have to call them structures? Yeah, I, I would say that. Uh... Uh, I'm not sure Tyler would consider a, a footpath a trail, but he would consider any uh, uh, structures that are associated with it, obviously structures. But if he's going to, if you're going to put gravel down or some type of, of grading that's involved in it too, um, you know, that's where you start to, it gets a little bit uh, gray. Yeah. And th this has come up quite a bit with the Andrews forest mm -hmm. in that, you know, the, there's a difference of opinion between the people who, want to ride the mountain bikes on the trails and the wildlife people about what a trail is and whether or not it needs permitting. So it will be something that eventually we'll have to resolve. I don't think it matters for this district, these two districts particularly. So, Chris. Um, just a question about um, on-ground improvement. Would a, because there are types of paving that are designed to be permeable um mm -hmm. to water would permeable pavement be an on-ground improvement yes uh, i'm sorry go ahead virginia well <laughs> i was going to say no because if it's permeable it's not impervious so i mean that's a question and we talked about you know, low impact development as a whole field of low impact development um, that talks about things like permeable pavement. And, you know, Keith, you know something about these questions. There are 
you know, systems that are stormwater management systems that allow for permeable paving. So I don't know, we'd have to decide about that, I guess, about whether an on ground improvement could include something that is actually permeable. Yeah, we'd, we'd want to, it, it's, that is a great question, Chris. Um, I would consider it at this point impermeable because uh, we haven't decided if we're going to um, allot a percentage of permeability to it. These structures um, have to be engineered and installed correctly, and then they have to be maintained on a yearly basis too to, to keep whatever their storage capacity is. So uh, that's, a, that's a, another uh, you know, a stormwater discussion that we do need to have. But I think at this point in time, we're not giving any credit to impermeables of the permeable pavement or pavers at this point, which is unfortunate. I'd really like to get that codified at some point. Yeah, we did talk about it, Keith. I remember you and I had quite a long conversation about this, about how to account for those kinds of systems. And we felt that we weren't equipped right now mm -hmm. and that we don't really have them <laughs> right. that need to be permitted. So, but at some time we will need to, and it may be when we start addressing the stormwater issue more, then it will come up that there are some kinds of pavements that are permeable. So right now we just say anything has got gravel on it, or any kind of paving material is impervious, and so it counts. We, it's a long conversation. That's all I can say. That it's probably beyond our scope right now. Lisa, sorry to butt in, Virginia. Um, you know, I've been attending some of the ACF meetings and Trails Committee meetings and so forth, and there's an awful lot of difference, I think, in in how they are viewing trails. You know, the definition of trails than what I'm seeing here. I don't know who's right or whether everybody isn't right or is right, but I'd suggest that uh, before we have any kind of a definition for planning purposes that we hammer out really what is a trail and where are they because there's trails everywhere. There's maps of trails, you know, on the website and so forth. So I, I think we're getting into a very tangled uh, area. So just- Into the weeds as it were. So to speak, yeah, impermeable yeah. weeds. Yeah. So, you know, I'm fine with that. I just put that out as something that we can think about and that we should be talking to these other people about. And so I would suggest that we don't include that. It doesn't have much bearing on these neighborhoods. Um, and it's maybe like the permeable paving that right now it's a little beyond our scope uh, to deal with. So anybody have any problem with just leaving that out for now and just keeping it on the radar? Okay, I'm not hearing anything about that. Does anyone have any concerns about having this term on ground improvements? If we don't, we're going to have to clarify the point about structures being driveways and um, parking areas actually being structures. And the problem there is if you call it one way, then setbacks is a problem. If you call it the other way, then lot coverage is a problem. So that's why we separated the two out from each other. Okay, so let's take that uh as an okay for now we'll get rid of the trails piece for now but keep it in mind yeah. um like we'll get rid of the emergency shelter for now but we'll keep it in mind and um you know maybe at our next meeting we can set the date for the public hearing and if anyone has any last minute questions that they've thought about that's fine we can talk about it then okay so the next one the next supporting document is the parking and loading section. So in our village residential neighborhoods text, the narrative of the district, we have said as per Act 47, one residential unit 
gets is the maximum required parking is one space. So this contradicts our parking table where multifamily and duplexes require 1.5 spaces per unit. So rather than trying to write a separate table for these districts and any other districts served by water and sewer, we introduce in the parking section a caveat so that when the zoning administrator sees that there's a conflict between what the district says and what the parking table says, he knows to refer to this caveat, which is in any district served by municipal water and sewer that allows residences, the parking requirement is one space per dwelling unit. So that is the resolution of the conflict between the parking table and the district. Otherwise, it's more complicated and more changes are required to different districts. But this just places Act 47 directly into our zoning ordinance. Any questions about that or? Pretty straightforward. Yes. And that, of course, will also go by the legal people to make sure that there's no problem there. I don't see what the problem would be exactly, but all right. So we'll take that for now. We'll accept that one if nobody has any comments. So the next one is we're going to the multifamily housing development standards. So the issue here was that originally we did not have multifamily housing standards we didn't need them in these districts, so we would not have had to consider this. However, Act 47 has required that we allow three and four, three to four unit multifamilies. That puts them in the category of multifamily story buildings that would have to, uh, you know, agree with the standards that we have put into place for multifamily. Based on so that was a new piece of the zoning that we put in place with the RC districts, if you remember that. And there have been some real world uses of this that have caused a little bit of rethinking of the way it was originally set up. So Keith and Tyler and I went through and looked at these to see and the DRB weighed in, you know, they didn't like this and that. So we reconfigured the language to meet those concerns, but still to have a section of the zoning that allowed people to feel comfortable with multifamily buildings, which are new in the neighborhoods, but beyond duplexes for the most part. There are some of them, obviously. So anyway, we'll just go through these quickly. The way it was originally written, it was written to apply to any lot that had three or more residential units on it. So in the case of the RC district, someone who had a duplex and a single family home and wanted to put an ADU, well, anyway, that would be three or more on one lot. But we felt that the point of it was related to buildings with three or four units, so multifamily buildings. And so we changed the word lot to building. So this only applies to buildings that have three and four units, three, you know, three or more units. Any multifamily with three or more units, if it's a single building, this section applies. It doesn't apply if there are several residential units on a lot. 
and there was an ambiguity in the way it was in the RC districts and this section. So that clears that up. It just applies to buildings. And the purpose of it section is to protect or enhance the appearance and quality of neighborhoods to ensure basic standards of living for the residents of the multifamily dwellings. So it has both of those purposes, but it applies to structures only, not lots. All right, so the second, the front doors portion, we didn't change anything there. Moving down to fire escapes and entry stairs. Um, we just put shells instead of must. That's a little technical fix. They have to meet the setback requirements. And actually, that must probably should be shall. Mark, you had a comment? Yeah, I'm just wondering about that eight foot setback for the stairway. Seems seems odd. You think it's too much or too little? I think it's too much. I mean, why are we? If you your story, if your stairs can't stop start until eight feet behind the building, and you got a regular, you know, thirty foot building, that's a hell of a. That's a hell of a steep uh, stairwell. I I just don't understand why it's there. Why? Um, why so the are point we of it. About that? Yeah, the point of it was like the point of setting garage doors back from the front of the building, because at your streetscape you want to have a human scale you know attractive if you want aesthetic look to the building with windows and doors so that it has a human face can be accessed from the front but those secondary things like you don't want a wall of fire escapes and garage doors facing the street that was the point would you really have a wall of fire escapes in, well in i don't know but it was. No, I don't know. Right. I, I, yeah. Well, I'm I'm coming from the same school of thought that I'm not a fan of the garage door setback either. I think that is excessive. Garage uh -huh. door on my house is is uh, face value and it looks just fine. Yeah. Well, see, that's the difference between the suburban look, which is what we have out here. You know, where you live and I live. A lot of people have their garage doors closer to the street, but you don't really have the same issues when the lots are bigger and, you know, there's more vegetation and the setbacks are bigger. You don't really have the set the same issues. I don't know. It was this is what was recommended by the housing consultant that the housing committee had. This was her list of things in the housing committee's report. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've looked also looked like in, in the neighborhoods around here, there's a lot of garage doors that face the street. That's the, yeah. the side of the street. But when buildings are closely set and people, a lot of people are walking on the sidewalk in a town, in a village center setting, then you are more likely to be concerned about the appearance of the buildings. So, so I mean, your suggestion would be to just take out that number, I think, is what you're saying, right? Yeah, I can see not putting them on the front of the house. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure of the of the risk of allowing it on the side of the house if it's a step step back, you know, just to get to the stairs. Right. Especially if I mean, it's external it, access. It is allowed on the side, but just set back from the front line. So, yep. Um, Gary, you had your hand up. Um, yeah. So maybe I don't quite understand what this says, but it seems like if we have a 10 foot front yard setback and you don't have the garage set back some, then you can't even park your vehicle totally on your property. Uh, we'd be out 
parked in the, you know, in, off the property with some of it, or the vehicle that's more than 10 feet long. So I think- well, what, makes, what if you're, what if you're 15 feet back? And, and or, what 20, ever... or even 20 feet back, which is, is not unheard of in these districts. And still we have to put the house, the, the driveway, another, uh, I'm sorry, the garage, another eight feet back on top of that. Yeah. It just makes sense. And then the, the stairwell, eight feet back also. Yeah, I don't understand what the stairwell is about. I mean, yeah. if, if, if there's a, if your house is on the road, maybe I can see that. But uh, there's a fair number of houses on uh, Main Street that have. Pretty good setbacks. And I'm not sure uh you know making them move their their garage back. You know, maybe maybe the, the garage shouldn't be more than 20 feet from the property line, you know, and at least flush with the house or something. But I'm just trying to give people some flexibility. It's really not a big deal. I don't have a dog in the fight. It just yep. seems a little over micromanaged to me. There are, I was looking at the garages in the village and many of them are set back behind the, you know, they don't come up to the front of the house, but I suppose you could do it by setback, you know, like a garage or exterior stairwell or one or the other or both could be um, measured as a different kind of a setback. So, but if you look at the village houses, a lot of them have the garages. They're back. They're set back. They're they're not leading in the front, and so there's plenty of room to park the cars. But joy. I kind of agree with Mark about the setback part, but I also wanted to know: Do we have a clear definition of what the front of the house is? Because I've lived in two houses where we argue <laughs> where the front and the back door is. So I don't know if we have a way to define that. Yes, we do. The front, okay. the well, <laughs> whichever side of the house faces the street is the front. No matter where you put your main door or entrance, the part okay. of the house that is facing the street and that front yard is and front setback is from the public street to that facade of the house. If you live on a corner, you have two front yards and two front setbacks, one from each street. It doesn't matter where you put your front door. It just relates to the street and the facade of the house that is facing the street. Now, if the corner of the house <laughs> is facing the street. I guess one or the other of those facades would have to be defined. What would you do with that, Keith? If the house was absolutely kitty corner to the front? Well, you'd have, you'd have I am off, okay. I'm not sure, I'd have to see it on a piece of paper and have to see a specific example, but um, you would have to make sure that those two corners of the front meet whatever the setbacks are so or the one or the one corner of the front uh, but i don't know what you which you would call the front yard not that i've ever really seen that yeah but. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's certainly a case by case basis and it certainly is not something we come across often to be honest with you um, but like yeah. you say it is on the corners yeah so joy does that answer your question yeah that helps with the front i'm glad that we have that but um that have is you, a definition know, that's in our zoning. Yep. Yeah. I know of houses on East Main Street where the garage is almost flush with the front door and it doesn't bother me. Um, I just wonder if there's situations because then we're making someone use up more of their um, impervious space by making the driveway longer, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just thinking it through. Yeah. And Keep in mind that this only refers to multifamily buildings, so it doesn't refer to single family homes. All right, that's or helpful. Duplexes. Thank you for reminding me. Either. It's just multifamily buildings, and, you know, the goal was not to have, like, 
your 15 unit building with a row of garages facing the street, whatever. But which is highly unlikely for a multi unit yes. family <laughs> building to have garages to be right. So, but, but the but it does happen, part, actually, part. in Essex, yeah. in particular, yep. I've seen them, but um, so yeah, I don't know if that makes a difference for you that it's only the multifamilies. Okay, well, we could think a little bit more about that one, I guess, 6.13.3 and 6.13.4 is the same, it, kind of in the same bucket, which is to try to keep the streetscape of village, multifamilies, human scale and welcoming and nice for people to walk to, past, walk past. Okay. <clears throat> And it does, I mean, if people are walking on the sidewalk and the driveway, you know, if the front setback is only 10 feet and the garage door is flush, then the car is going to be parked with its bumper on the sidewalk. And so the people walking by aren't really gonna have any notice that somebody is backing out. That was another item that was mentioned. Yeah, I was I was mi mixing up my districts any also, you know, because we have that same sort of language in the village north and the village south. You bring up a, a very good point that, you know, this is a multifamily unit. This is a commercial operation. If it's a commercial operation, then the builder can uh, put the extra coin in or, or engineering necessary to accomplish what you want with these with the setbacks like that. It makes them a lot more sense. I was definitely thinking of single family homes, which, you know, when we get to those districts, we'll have a, we'll, we'll bring that up again. Yep. And I mean, even in these districts, it doesn't apply to single family homes. So I think um, it does. Well, it only applies to multifamily homes in these districts, in any district, it only applies to multifamily. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I'm going to have to, uh... I'm pretty sure I read something about those setbacks and it's stuck in my craw. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get, get that citation to us. Yeah. <laughs> All right. It's uh, Yeah, well, it may well, be. When in, we get there, I'll bring it up. Okay. Yeah, we may have put it into the RC districts. I don't know. Well, I don't really remember quite at the moment. Um, anyway, it's it's definitely a suburban style to have the garage in front of or flush with the house and you know we're not saying anything about that if it's a single family home um anyway certainly not in this section yeah, this is not saying anything let's, about let, it let, let's leave it as you've got it i think that's far more practical and it's a commercial venture people can people can build and do it you know have the engineering and the the, the ability to do that let's leave the way it is Okay, anybody else on point three or point four? Um, point five, we didn't know that we needed that extra language in there. The lesser of 20% of the lot width or 20 feet. Keith, I don't know, you, you had something to say about that. Let me get my bearings here. <laughs> yeah, this is a while ago that we talked about this one. Um, so the lesser of 20% of the lot width. So let's well, yeah, say you have. Yeah, we struck through that, that lesser, because that's, I mean, for a lay person, that's a little difficult. I think that's why. And then we went with a hard number, right? And that's what I'm seeing. Right, here. we went with the hard number of 20 feet. Right. So the question is, if there was 50 if there was a 50 foot lot uh, frontage lot right. width 20% of that would be what 10, 10. feet yep so or would we be okay with a 10 foot driveway Yeah, I, be, I believe Gary uh, Gary was chiming in on that a few months ago. I believe we're going. I, 
for some reason I thought we're still on multifamily though, right? Bear yes, with me we're, here. That's we're still on multifamily. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, that totally makes sense now. So, Gary, what do you do? You have an opinion on whether? So, if we've reduced the frontage required in these districts because the lots can be as small as 0.2 acres. We've reduced the amount of frontage to 55 feet is the suggested, what we're suggesting. So if you had a 55 foot frontage on a 0.2 acre lot, would you like to have a driveway that was less than 20 feet in width? Well, for a multifamily building, I, I think you, you wouldn't be allowed to do that under the public work standards, would you? Of something that narrow for a multifamily entrance? I don't know. Do you know, Keith? Is no, there are there special no. standards for a multifamily driveway that are different from any other driveway in our well, even, even for a regular driveway, um, I think there's standards of I think at least twelve feet. So if you had a fifty foot yeah. 50 foot uh, frontage, you, and you had the 20% rule and you could only have 10 feet. I think it's better just to say 20 feet and be done with it. Yeah, and I think that that was the uh, the logic behind that. Yep. yep. I think that's what you thought, Keith, yeah. anyway, that it was better just to have the feet for, especially if it's a multifamily. Yep. I mean, you're given that you, you, you're given a lot of latitude by saying 20 feet. It must not exceed 20 feet. That's pretty generous. Yeah. OK, it must not exceed 20 feet so it can be smaller. Yep. If the public work specs allows it. Yeah, I don't think that that applies to, you know, in, interior driveways to private property. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody have any problems with that being that 20 feet? No, it's good. Okay. All right. Parking areas point six. Parking areas shall be screened with privacy fencing and or vegetation. We just changed a few words that seem to be unnecessary. Point seven, privacy, which was the big one that the that Tyler and the DRB thought was too uh, difficult to work with because it was written as something that they would need to consider and they didn't really feel like they could consider it properly as I understand it. So, but in fact, the privacy consideration is something that uh, agitates people about multifamily buildings. So we thought it was important to have something about privacy, but all that is required is the developers must provide evidence to show that consideration has been given to the location, orientation, and design of the building in order to protect the privacy of residents and neighbors. And this consideration may include factors such as A through D. So to us, that didn't seem like particularly onerous. A developer could say, yes, I have given consideration to it. And I have offset these windows building from this building to this building, I've slightly offset the windows. And that ought to be enough to satisfy the DRB. They don't have to do anything except, except show, you know, uh, look at the fact that the developer has given some consideration to it. So it's a tricky, it's a tricky thing, Chris. Uh, yeah, actually, the, the way this is worded, isn't it actually less than you just said? They don't actually have to have done anything. They That's just right. have to show evidence of consideration. So what, what does this actually even mean? 
Well, it means that the DRB or the zoning administrator, whichever one is doing the permitting, has to say what consideration. It does say they must show evidence that consideration has been given. So they have to show some kind of evidence, like here's the design of the way the windows are placed on the building, and this is protecting the privacy because it's not looking directly into the next door windows. That's all. I mean, the DRB and the zoning administrator wanted to just scrap the whole thing, totally scrap the whole thing. So this is like a compromise between scrapping the whole thing and at least having something in there that showed that somebody was thinking about privacy. So, but but the developer could respond by saying, well, okay, here's a diagram showing the sight lines and everything, and it does show that privacy is going to be an issue, and we did nothing about it, and that would still be acceptable, right? Because consideration is shown, but they didn't do anything. Well, if the DRB wanted to accept that, then I guess that would be fine. Yep. I mean, it depends how much we want to require. Well, I guess maybe I'm tending more in the other direction as like if it's if it's not actually going to do anything, why even have it in here? Mm. Mm -hmm. So do you feel that it, something should be in here about privacy or not? Well, I think it would be I, I agree with you. I think that that privacy is a concern in multifamily buildings. I don't know the best way to address that, but if we do address it, it should be in a way that has, that's actionable, I guess, and this doesn't seem actionable. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, Gary. So I would suggest you keep it in there uh, just so the neighbors have come out it gives a a chance at the DRB meeting to at least have the conversation uh, with the neighbors and the neighbors' concerns can get out there at least. You know, I think when you start trying to regulate it, it's kind of hard to come up with the standards. Uh, I mean, I think we had that discussion in an earlier version where how you can how do you actually regulate things like sight lines and everything? But at least this is a chance to open discussion and think about it. And maybe through those discussions, the developer will hear the neighbors or hear the DRB and uh, be amenable to some changes. I think it's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. Because there are other things that the DRB is asked to consider too, you know, other things about and advise about how the project could be improved. For instance, you know, in the PUDs, there's language about the, the beginning hearing, the sketch plan hearing, the DRB is is tasked with advising how the project could be improved, <laughs> you know, but there's nothing that actually says what they have to do exactly. This is part of their job. The DRB's job is to think about how to make these projects work. So let's see, I think Ian, you had your hand up. Ian's gone away. Ian, did you have something you wanted to say? Okay, well, we'll come back to him, I guess. No, oh, he's gone, gone. Oh no, he's right there. Okay. His his screen is still here. So, um, okay. So, what do you want to do with this? Do do we want to think about it more, or do we want to? What do we want to do with it? Let's leave it in. At least for the time being, I don't leave see it. it. Come up with a better reason to take it out. Yeah, I I thought Gary made a good point. Let's just leave it in. Yeah. Okay. Right. All right. So point eight, outdoor living space. This is to ensure that there is some outdoor space. Now, in most cases, the lot coverage is going to take care of it. There's going to be enough lot coverage. But we just want to make sure and they can, you know, that the building, 
can fulfill this in any of these ways. Each unit can have a private or semi-private outdoor space, like a little yard or a courtyard or you know, if you look at in Heinsberg, some of those triplexes and quadplexes, they have a little backyard, small backyard that's very defined. Um, or it can have common outdoor living areas to be shared by everyone. So this, I imagine, is going to be the backyard, the joint backyard of a three or four family. You know, a small, in this neighborhood, they're only going to be three and four family. Uh, so the, the lot coverage is going to allow there to be a shared area. That's a common outdoor living space. Um, and go up a or down a little bit, Keith, if you go on a little bit. Um, what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah no, back, 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 to just that right there. Yep. Yeah. So anyway, these are all just ways that you can make sure that there is a small amount of outdoor space yeah I, I think it's it's a quality of life approach it's a quality of life and it's an appearance you know it's generally to make sure that the neighbors feel that this property is not causing their neighborhood to not look as good as they would like it to look that there is some greenery there is some place for children to play. Any one of these items can fulfill that um, category. Would uh, three be satisfied with just a, a lawn? Uh, yeah. Yep. yep, vegetated, that's okay. fine. It can have a lawn. Yep. And four, improve to accommodate activities such as sitting, walking, you know, <laughs> you can pretty much have anything for sitting or walking. You could have a picnic table or you could have grass to sit on or to walk on. So it just can't be dirt, I guess, was the goal here. Okay, landscaping. Go, can we go on to nine if nobody has anything else to say about that? We didn't do anything with landscaping, laundry, bulk storage. It's really important to have outdoor storage for multifamily houses. Otherwise, you have a lot of outdoor storage done in the common grassy area or whatever, you know, on the porch. So there needs to be a storage area of some kind. Buttermilk has it in the basement, so yep. that could, could be there, could be a separate building, could be attached to the unit. Okay, mechanicals and utilities. We got rid of um, the location, and that was mostly, I think, to Chris's point that the the uh, heat pumps need to go on the front sometime because you can't always determine where they go. So we got rid of that. They just have to be landscaped or screened to prevent visibility from the public road. So you can put a bush in front or if it's in front. And the waste storage, trash and recycling receptacles have to be available to the tenants, readily available, but dumpsters have to be kept in an enclosure or completely screened with vegetation and may not be placed in the front yard. Gary. But, um, the <clears throat> The mechanical one, does that include a meter box, electrical meter box? I, I, I wouldn't know. think so, no. No, okay. thank you. Um, 
Ian, did you have a comment that you wanted to make about something somewhere back there? You seem to go away. No. Okay. I I, unfortunately, I had a phone call come in when you were in the Okay. Room. Sorry. All right. All right. And then the EV charging for every 10 units, we have that anyway. No, no change there. All right, so we'll keep this, I guess, the way it is, unless anybody has anything else to add and look at it carefully again over before we set the public hearing. And I think we might be out of time for these um, residential neighborhoods. I think we're out of time, but look over the new version of the residential neighborhoods. We've taken out the whole thing about sidewalks because we couldn't figure out how to make it work. The sidewalks in Richmond are in the towns right away. They belong to the town. Um, so we just took that all out. And that is about the main change between the last version and this draft 24. We went over elder facility, took out the sidewalks. That's about it. So what I would really like to do is to be able to, we will have the maps by next time the regional planning is working on the maps, the new maps. And I would like to be able to set a date to hold our public hearing um, on these two districts. That okay with everybody? Final questions for next time or changes? I know, Joy, that you don't think the density is enough that we're really doing anything, but my feeling is that's probably all we can do right now. So, unless people feel otherwise. Okay, not hearing any further comments for our next meeting. Let's be ready to vote to set our public hearing if possible. If nobody comes up with any major, major new changes. All right, so let's move on to number six, which are discussion of buttermilk. And our main task here is to, you know, get through these points. The first one being density. We've talked about the commercial requirement. Now let's talk about density some more. Has anybody thought further about density? Uh, this is the same draft that you had last time because we didn't come to any conclusion about it. So um, if we can go to the density section, that's probably the next key point that we want to be talking about. Any thoughts about density? So the reason that this is at 1 18th or 18 units per developable acre is because that was a compromise between what there is now, which is 15 units per acre, and what might be a useful density, which is the downtown density of 24 units per acre. This is kind of a compromise to start the discussion. We can go up, we can go down, whatever we want to do here. Um, this gives them nine additional units which seems like some number to put into the commercially, the space where the commercial requirement has been removed. Mark. I don't want to go down. You want to go down? You, you asked. <laughs> yeah. You okay. Asked well, and I'm, you know, I don't know why, why we're kicking it up to nine, especially if you start factoring in, uh, and we still have to get into this, but these density bonus things where you're crediting them and giving them bonuses for workforce housing, which is, you know, 
completely i don't know that's that's a that's a crazy density bonus thing but you start looking at some of this stuff and and you know 40 percent more housing you're talking you're going from from 45 up to 54 and then 40 percent on top of that you're at 27 54 80 over 80 units where are you getting the 40 what are you talking that's about it. That's a forty percent in the forty uh, percent that you that number in the uh, density bonuses section. Well, that is only the forty percent number relates to a particular part of Act Forty Seven that says if you make an affordable housing development, which has a specific definition then that's when that 40% kicks in. That 40% doesn't just kick in randomly. It only kicks in if you are creating an affordable housing development of which there is a specific definition, which includes 20% of affordable, 20% of the units are affordable, true affordable. In other words, they're income sensitive as well as rent controlled. Then you, may be able to have the 40 percent and go up one floor that's in act 47 but only for that which they are not likely to elect uh, maybe you know i mean if they elect oh, that maybe. that's a specific thing well they're not allowed to have any other density bonuses the way it's written if they take that if they take the affordable housing development strategy they don't get other density bonuses. So in the, if, if that's the case and they do take that, then that would be a good thing, I guess, because so many people have expressed uh, a desire to have true, truly affordable housing units. Right, uh, so exactly. I mean, that has its own benefits. Win-win. So yeah, well, I mean, you know, part of I think it's 40% is a, you know, that's a lot of houses. You're you're talking, well, instead of adding 20, you'd add, I suppose, 22 or 20, uh, 24 maybe units on top of 51. They are at 75 units, but even still, if we're going to give density bonuses... Well, I, I don't know. Maybe you want to wait till you get to the density bonus section. Yeah, I mean, and we can that, start hashing some of that out. But because um, we may or may not, we may or may not want to have density bonuses. We may want to have all our increases as the form of density bonuses, or we may want to not have density bonuses. You know, it's how you arrange these elements. How you you know how you arrange the elements. Right, Chris. Um, yeah, just in general, um, you had brought up a couple of meetings ago the idea of meeting with the select board to get their input on this. Um, what is your thinking now? Because I thought that was a good idea, and I'm a little concerned about us coming up with a number here without input from them. I, I think, you know, again, in the in the interests of sending something to the select board, do we have some idea that they're going to find acceptable? Well, my feeling is that we need to have a proposal from whence they start thinking, you know. So if we have, I mean, or maybe we have more than one proposal, but I don't want to just say let's meet with the select board how do you feel about density i mean because that discussion is going to be like this discussion yeah i think we should try to have as the planning commission have an idea what we are interested in in terms of density let's have an idea and take that to the select board and to them say also we could go up we could go down we could go towards density bonuses you know, but can't we start with some idea of our own about what we think would work? For instance, 45. starting 
for instance, well, what about the fact that we are going to re recommend in our work removing the commercial requirement? If we don't give them any more units, they will put 31 units in the building, they will be bigger, they will be more expensive. So if we go up and we give them an, at least an additional nine units, then they will be able to have somewhat more of a variety of costs. If we go to the density of the village downtown, we get more units. Many will be small, but they will be less costly. I'm sorry, but can we just stop making references to the 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 village block as a default in density? That was density that was defined over a hundred years ago when there was hardly anybody in Richmond and they had that density set up there. They certainly didn't have the the parking issues and the other things that are concerned. We keep going back to saying, oh, well, it's 24 units in, in, uh, in the upper block. Well, nobody was there. There wasn't even zoning existed back then. They just threw them up. And then we now have decided that that is our baseline that we should rise, raise everything up to, to meet at least that, which is totally antiquated and unrelated to any kind of modern zoning regulations. It, it just, and yet we use that as our default. It, it's, it's driving me nuts. Mm. Well, there's a certain logic to it because then you have the same numbers going for you. I mean, people have suggested- It was a hundred years ago. And there wasn't any cars. So, you know, you could fit a couple more horses on the parking spot for a, for a vehicle back then. You know, it's, it's not, it's not this, you're, you're comparing apples and oranges and you're saying, oh, those were oranges back then. So now we should make everything oranges. It's, it, it is not logical, appropriate goal to just throw that out there simply because we have uh you know a uh, half an acre of space in the downtown that was built 100 years ago at that density and now we want to raise everything up to that or or put that as our goal for for uh, allowing zoning enrichment it just is it's not the same hmm. well it is a number that is somewhere between the, for instance, 120 units that have been proposed by some for the buttermilk property. Proposed and... by buttermilk? <laughs> 120? Well, <laughs> yeah, of no, course they're going to propose necessarily... 120. It's more money well, for them. It's no, it's no real factor. Did anybody in Richmond say, hey, we should go to 120 units per acre? I, I, I don't know. I, I haven't been yeah. attending the housing committee. Maybe, yeah. maybe there's right. some there's some people who are extremely yes. ardently in favor of, you know, just sky rises and and everybody walks to work locally and, and nobody nobody has a car anymore. I suppose that contingent exists, but I'd really like to get a a real impression from the community rather yeah. than just, you know, from us straight to the select board and then making the decision without, without bringing no, we're, the people in. We're going to go and talk to the select board about their opinions, but we're also going to talk to the public about their opinions. You know, I mean, Mark, part of what we're trying to do is to help out with the housing crisis. So we may need to increase our density anyway. So we won't, call it the default density, but it is a density that is possible in this location. Chris. Uh, yeah, I think in, I think Mark makes a, a, a valid point, you know, is that there, we shouldn't be referring to a default density. And in that same vein, uh, you know, I think it's important to remember that buttermilk does not sit on the Richmond Select Board or Planning Commission. So people will propose all kinds of things, but, and all kinds of things are technically possible, but what's the realm of the, of the probable or even better, the desirable. And 
I think if if we are if this exercise is about preparing to talk to the select board about it, I support that. I think that's great, and I think the idea of even having you know a a preferred uh, uh, number and our rationale behind it makes sense. But I think we also need to be ready to present our thinking in detail and talk about all the things that we've talked about here about Act 47, about the effect of removal of the commercial requirement, you know, as you've said, on the size of units and sort of really be be ready to get into it with the uh, with the select board because they will have strong feelings too. And they're at the end of the day, they're the ones with the votes. So Chris, what is would you suggest? First of all, do you like the idea of just having a straight density, having a density, a base density and density bonuses, just having bonus density bonuses? Do you have any thoughts about that, about the housing crisis in general? What would you like to see as a density? Well, I mean, okay, uh, putting the housing crisis, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the housing crisis aside as a given, okay? <laughs> um, but that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, we can build or that Better Milk can build whatever they want there. Um, I think the idea, I think I think a, a base density is should be part of this and a density bonus should be in response to um, uh, if there's something that we feel particularly uh, uh, moved by uh, and appropriate to reward through, through density, but more importantly, maybe to keep that in reserve to offer to the select board is something that they could use, you know, to reward things that are important to them. Because I remember the last time that we visited this as a committee, there wasn't anything that really leapt forward that seemed like people were saying, oh yeah, let's let's definitely base a density bonus on this. And maybe people are have a different view now after thinking about it, but um, it didn't seem like that the density bonus was particularly compelling back then when we last talked about it. So do you have a preferred density number for the base density? Given the factors that we've talked about, the fact that there will be this commercial space that's available now for uh, residences and that we do have a housing crisis, and even though you want to put that aside, but it's sort of a factor, um, do you have a number that you like or what? Um. I, I want to talk about it a little bit more. I'm 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 struggling with this one, but I think it's it's probably higher than Mark wants. <laughs> okay, that's a start. <laughs> um, Mark likes the 15. Ian, um, I I think 18 is a good number to bring to the select board to at least just get get the conversation started. Um, I don't think that's going to offend anybody. Um, it's not like, you know, if you were proposing bringing some absurd number to them that was going to affect the credibility of the work we're doing here, I think I'd probably object, but like, you got to start somewhere, like mm -hmm. you said. And I think, uh, I think the compromise number that is on there is, uh, suitable for that purpose. That's it. Okay, great. Thanks. Who else do we have here? Is anybody else here? That's it for um, Joy. What are you thinking? Sorry, I have a hard time finding the mute button on my phone. Um, I agree with Ian. Okay. I say bring it. Yeah, with that. And if we have to pare it down, we do. Okay. Anybody else want to weigh in on this question? I mean, you know, we've got to start somewhere and it does open up the conversation. I can support that, yep. 
All right, so let's go with that for the moment. And let's go to the density bonus question then. Um, so if you want to look at the item B under buttermilk, consider the density bonus section, which could be added on top of this, or you know, it could replace this, or however you want to do it. Let's go. Can you go all the way to the next document, Keith, which is consider density bonus section 15? Yep. Uh, that one. Yep. Okay. So let's say that we offered 18 as a compromise number. Maybe the select board liked 18 and we gave buttermilk the choice of just having eight, the 18 number, which is nine extra units, keep it simple. Or they could add some, if they wanted more units, which they may well need or want more units, they would have to supply them in the form of density bonus units. And skipping over the general requirements for the moment, the types of density bonus units that would be available would be workforce housing, which in the housing committee, they talked about the range of workforce housing being between 60 and 80% AMI. It would be for 15 years. And that is, by the way, what the affordable housing development portion of Act 47 only requires 15 years of the rent control piece. So this would be one type of housing. We can alter it in any way that we want. You know, does it have to be, uh, and it's a, it's a simplified form of the true affordable housing where there's an income sensitive piece. You have to verify that the renter only spends 30% of the income on the housing costs. This does not include that. This just includes keeping the rent at 80% of AMI on the chart, which by the way, there's a new one as of April, 2024, there's a new VHFA chart. So we have to be sure we're using the right one. And that would just have to be reported once a year by buttermilk. This is the unit, this is the rent, this is 80% of AMI. So that would be one. And it's one for one, you get a unit if it's one of these. The second kind that, and the first two are the ones that it seemed to me like would pass the bank's muster. You know, if they're gonna have to get a loan, what is the bank going to be okay with? It's not affordable housing as true affordable housing. However, the banker that I spoke to thought workforce housing might work or the senior aging in place which is a dwelling unit that is equipped with the features that allow for aging in place of which there is a list. And that's a one time thing. The developer just has to put those in the bars in the bathroom and all that kind of stuff. It's a cost to the developer, but it's a one time cost. And then they can market these as senior aging in place housing. There's no requirement that seniors have to live in them, but they're available for seniors. The next two, C and D, are more problematic. Condominiums are problematic because having a building that has some condos and some apartments doesn't work very well. You have a homeowners association, you have a landlord, they're all kind of responsible for the same thing. There may be conflicts. So that was something that we had talked about as being desirable for the wealth building question. And then here's the true income sensitive affordable housing. This is the one that meets the Act 47 definition exactly. And in the general part above this, it says if you are using this part, you can't have the other 
density bonuses. The shared equity is possible. Um, it also needs, I don't think buttermilk would select it because it needs a qualified buyer. You know, it's a shared equity program has to be involved. So there's a third party involved. But anyway, so of those, the first two, the senior aging in place and the workforce seem to be the ones that would be most acceptable to a bank. If there's true income sensitive affordable housing, then the thought was they get two units for the price of one. In other words, if one of them is true income sensitivity affordable, they get to have another one because that's a significant step up as a benefit. So anyway, I mean, I think tonight what we have time to talk about really is whether we want to try to have a density bonus provision and whether we want it to add on to the base density that is increased or whether we want to offer just density bonus extra apartments, extra units. So I'd like to have some comments maybe on that. If you back up a little bit, Keith, we can look at the kind of the general criteria about these density bonus units. Basically, you get one for one unless it's true income sensitive affordable housing, you get two for one. There's a minimum size and, you know, we can talk about that. Some of their current apartments are 360 square feet. So maybe that's, you know, we just wanted them not to be tiny. They can't be used for short term rentals. You know, they have to adhere to the other specs of the district. And, you know, the chart has to be used. We have actually found that the HUD average medium income chart is not the same as the VHFA chart. The HUD does not include the utilities. VHFA does include the utilities. So we have to straighten that out. The Housing Committee uh, investigated that somewhat. Those two charts are a little bit different by a few hundred dollars. Um, and then the last point is that if they qualify under the affordable housing development, which refers to the whole building, whole project, is not eligible for additional density bonus units under this section. So that is just a draft, a first draft of what it might look like. And it's not complicated like the charts that give points for different things like Heinsberg has a very complicated system of density bonus awarding density bonuses this is a very simple system it's just you get one of these density bonus units if you make it one of these things that we want or you get two if it's truly income sensitive affordable housing so for instance, an example would be, okay, they take the base density of 18 units per acre, and then they put three that are guaranteed to be workforce housing for 15 years at 80% of AMI, and they make three uh, senior housing. So they would get another six units. It, it doesn't seem to me like they're gonna take a lot of these units because there are some costs associated with them. But they would get another six, so that's another 15. Their floors currently have about 13 units per floor in building two. So, you know, if they replaced the whole of the ground floor with rental units, that would be another 13 units. So they might take a few of these density bonuses. We don't know that, but it's a place to start the conversation. I'm having a hard time. Oh, sorry. A hard time what? I'm having a hard time thinking about what a negative outcome from this would be. So I have some I thoughts when I'm called on. 
<laughs> Excuse me. I, I apologize, Mark. I didn't see your hand was up. <laughs> yes. Well, Chris's well, hand so, is so, up first. So, first of all, Chris to be called on first. Yeah. Yeah. And just one point to that, Ian, is that we would suggest or re, we would put into place a maximum total density. In other words, so it wouldn't be totally open ended like you could take 40 of these. So um, the residential density in the buttermilk district would have a certain base residential density, and then it would have a total residential density, which includes the base plus the density units. The number that I had in mind, of course, was 24, <laughs> which is Mark's favorite number. But anyway, we would set up a cap. So, you know, the cap could be uh, 20 units per acre. So if you, per developable acre, if you had a base density of 18, then um, you have three acres, you would get an extra six. You could have an extra six. So that's another thing that is up to us to determine what the maximum total residential density that we would like. So in my mind, I was thinking, well, maybe they take three of these and three of these, that's another six units, something like that. But of course, anything's possible. I think, um, was Chris, were you next, I think? I think I was. Um, yeah. yeah, Keith, could you scroll down a little bit uh, here so we can, what I would like to see, uh, not, not quite that far, um, but what I, yeah, that's perfect. What I would like to see is another um, option below 6.15.4 that is between A and D. And what this would be would be um, uh, housing that is sent at some percentage of AMI, and then we can talk about that, but is also means tested but would not require third party uh, ownership. So what I'm talking about is something like the a VHFA rental revolving loan fund with the requirements for that program. And at, uh, at that, you know, the, that's, that would be something that I think would be more uh, of interest to buttermilk, certainly than, um, than D. Um, uh, but would uh, avoid the problem with A that um, it, it, I sort of think of as the New York City um, 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 uh, what do they call that? Uh, basically, it, it, you're not sure that you're actually helping the people who need it the most with, with option A, I think. So um, I'd like to add that that additional option for consideration uh, in this section. So go over again what that would include. Okay. It, so it doesn't, it, it includes an income sensitive piece. Yes. So yeah, so there would be income screened um, and, and it would also be a limit on the, um, on, on the rent um as um you know for some number of years some period of time um and uh and those would be the two the two major components of it yep and did you have an ami in mind like 60 80 65 to 120 or whatever 65 to 80 I'm uh, not right offhand, but I would like to refer to uh, what's in that um, RRLF uh, at um, at the VHFA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Housing Committee had a pretty long discussion the other night about how to think about these terms, the kinds of affordable that we have, and they kind of were thinking of 60 to 80 percent as being workforce housing below 60 percent as being subsidized <coughs> in some manner or third party arranged and then you know 100 percent or more is market rate those terms aren't exact but we were working to have some kind of conversion uh, between the different levels of ami and um, the terms that we were using 
So anyway, okay, so I've got that down. I'm sorry, <laughs> could I ask a question about Chris's proposal? Yes, go ahead, Mark. Thank you. Uh, Chris, are you saying that these would be rental units that are subsidized by both VHFA and reduced housing, the, the reduced AMI that Buttermilk is willing to offer? Well, they could be, um, uh, they would be rental units. And we know that that's Buttermilk's preference is to remain a landlord. They don't want to Absolutely. sell the property. Um, they could in, uh, involve uh, subsidies from VHA, VHFA or other sources, but wouldn't, wouldn't need to. This would be something that Buttermilk could administer itself. It's basically... Uh, you know, allowing the market rate units to, uh, to subsidize the rents on a on a minimum number of uh, of units that would be um, rent limited or whatever the proper term is for that, and available to uh, income screen tenants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. That seems like that would be possible. Whether they would be interested in that, of course, we don't know until we ask them. But um, that's like a cross between A and D, some kind of a cross between A and D. Correct. It's it's not an affordable housing development unless twenty percent is, and that is more than they're willing to. It's not a place they're willing to go, as far as we know, so far what they've said. But they could have maybe a couple of units or a few units that, you know, that might be something that if they had additional funding, they would be able to um, see their way clear to subsidize those units. Um, Mark. You had something else to say, perhaps. I actually do, Virginia. Thank you for acknowledging me. Well, I thought it might be the same hand that you had up from before, but. Nope, nope. I had closed it down and uh, left it okay. for a while. And then came Great. Um, yeah, perfect. So, so a couple things here. First of all, I thought we had talked about uh, considering uh, public parking as a uh, density bonus. Um, so in the old days, when we first put up this zoning, first made the Jolina Court District, we did talk about that. Yes, I remember. As a, yes. So what this version has is that is not offered as a density bonus, that, that's but, it is re but it's required if you read through the proposed draft, it's required that some spaces be offered as public parking. Where's that? Oh, uh, it's is under... That in the, is that in the Jolina Court District? Because I don't remember seeing that. In, yeah, in this draft. It's, um. let's see, where is it here? I think we found it very cumbersome and hard to work with when we offered that as a density bonus. So this that's why the focus here is just density bonuses that are about unit about units. It's under um, section parking requirements, which is section 3.9.7 or 6, 7, I guess. <clears throat> and it's item three in addition to the required commercial parking spaces 10 parking spaces shall be provided for public parking parking setbacks and i think that comment on the right regarding that is still open right and we 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 don't know whether this would yeah. Stand up to legal scrutiny. Yeah, we don't know. Well, no, actually, in terms of le it could be leased or joint parking. Keith might be able to talk about that, although we need to probably 
go to our last item in a minute here. Yeah, um, look, look on the joint parking facilities. That's a definition that's in the uh, parking section. And that sp speaks to directly to leased parking. I'm so that's leased parking that uh, uh, another company could, could lease out or the town itself could pay them for additional parking spaces? Yes. But that would be a mandated for that district. It's 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 a it's it's allowed in the parking regulations to do in any district. Okay, but um, we're talking about here as far as anything that we can do to help offset the parking. Crunch. Yeah, because because, because the, there, there's no way in heck that an additional fifty parking spaces are uh. Of, of additional 50 no, units are only going to require yep. 50 parking spaces. Yep, we hear you totally. Okay. Yep. But, but I don't see how this 10 parking spaces that the town then has to pay them for access to that's, that's the, our caveat in this district only. Well, what, that what, seems what, like highly. We can't litigious. force it though. We can't no, force we can't it. Force it. Yeah, that's the problem. That's I, exactly, I I feel your pain. <laughs> that's exactly my point. So, yep. so what good is that versus where if we offer a density bonus for public parking, then they will be that will be enforced. Well, I mean Granted, that's all of the density, all the density bonus parking will go to residents of right. You know, it won't it won't actually help the community it'll just lessen the burden on the community that's going to be increased by the lack of parking that's that's coming about with with an additional 50 units going in that's a great point it is a great point thank you so one other thing i just kind of want to make clear is we're talking about kicking the units up to 18 per acre which is nine extra units and to Virginia's point that each floor has right now 13 units per acre, you were saying, all right, because they're gonna they can add another uh 34. No, so they have been allowed 31 units in building two, and yeah. their current drawing shows 13 units on two floors and not quite that many on the oh. upper floor, I think, and none on the ground floor. But right. the drawing of the second and third floor shows a design that has 13 units each so floor. When they're packing it, that's 26 and then eight units on the on the fourth floor. Not, Some other not, floor, yeah. Oh. So now we're saying, okay, we're gonna go with commercial. They're going to reduce the commercial. We're not going to have any commercial whatsoever. Well, now, they might have a little, but they might have a little. So they are. They want to said, put a gym and a bagel shop. They already said they want to put in some commercial. So that one floor with, let's say, the same high density of thirteen units per floor, and they put in a gym and a bagel shop, and then you give them an extra nine units off of their original plan that pretty much fills in that extra space that is no longer commercial with the nine units without any density bonus benefits for the community. And I just want to point that out so people can mull on that, please. Mm -hmm. We're giving them an extra nine units on top of the 45 that they have. Yes. And we're not, and ultimately they could, they would be hard pressed to cram those extra nine units in on that extra non-commercial space from that original commercial dedicated floor that they had. So now we're going to cram in nine more. Where is their motivation to do any density bonuses? They're going to take those nine units and run. They're like, okay, thank you very much. Not interested in uh, affordable housing, income housing, community parking, any of those issues, we have absolutely everything we wanted with reduced commercial and, and extra residential units. 
Have a nice day. And also one last point, just so people are thinking about this, just to be aware, you're talking about adding another uh, 31 units. You want to kick that up to 40. 40 units, let's just say, is half of those units are going to be two people living in it, almost certainly more than that. So you're looking at a population increase of uh, 65 extra beds, say around 60 beds to, for someone to sleep in. Population of Richmond as a whole is what, 4,500? So we're talking about on this one piece of property, a population increase of 1.5%. Our contribution to the housing crisis in Vermont is increasing our population by 1.5% on a three acre parcel with, without any benefit and you and you want to increase it even more. Well, there, there, I would say that that assumes that the population is coming from the outside also. You know, it, it could be existing population too. You just don't know. Well, yes, yeah. I suppose my son could move out of the downstairs exactly. and rent one of those places right. and the population right. wouldn't increase, but then I would have, you know, some living space and then <laughs> that's yeah. not the point. Yep. Okay. You know? Well, yeah. So please think about that. Would you guys? And, yeah. and also, I really can't emphasize enough, at what point are we planning on letting the community know what we're doing here? Because it seems like yeah. we're way past that point. And you're talking about going straight to the select board with this, with no plans of public hearings. No, 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 Mark. We're not taking a plan to the select board to approve. We're con collaborating with the select board to get some idea of what they like. There's the select board that it has to get by. There's the public, which we will have public in to talk about it. And there's buttermilk. Okay. All of those buttermilk. three stakeholders have to agree on the plan if we're going to have any additional housing there, which we clearly need in Richmond. So, you know, we're going to be talking. We don't have a plan. Everybody thinks we have a plan. We're just it, discussing it sort of what the like possibilities it. are. We've, we've got this regulation sort of sketched out without, uh, I, I mean, maybe it'll take a lot longer than I think for us. It'll to take a lot stuff. longer than you think. Okay. It's don't not we have to have game. public hearings? I mean, that's a part of the whole process. Like we, we have we're not to have sneaking public anything. hearings. Yeah, but yeah, I'm you... here now to help sort of formulate our some. But we can't. We have to have them when everything is finalized. It goes yeah. right to the select board, pretty much right after that. Like we. Yeah. It, okay, so this is. Yeah. And I have to go too, problem. by the way. Yeah. So Chris has his hand up. It's nine o'clock. We're going to have to continue this discussion until our next meeting. I think it's. You know, it's an important discussion that we have. We're the planning commission. We need to think about what seems to work and then present it to all these different groups. Select board people, how are you feeling about it? Public, how are you feeling about it? You know, buttermilk, could you do this or not? Or is this still a no-go? All of these things have to happen. It's nowhere near being a polished final proposal. So please don't think that. It's a discussion phase. So, Chris. I would like to move we adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Joy, a second day. We will adjourn unless anyone has strong feelings against it. Good night, it's you guys. Like night. it's nine o'clock. <laughs> More discussion to come. So, great. Thank you all. I know three. Unbelievable. Thank you, Tim Smith and Lisa Miller for coming. And I hope you didn't get your thoughts not shared. But I wouldn't have missed this for the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, there will likely be more. So it might be, you know, yeah. Continuing process for some for some time. Yeah. So anyway. mind if I give you mind if I give you a call? No, go okay. ahead. Just not right now. <laughs> oh, oh, not right now. Okay. No, not right now. Maybe later. Thank okay. you, Keith. Happy anniversary. Happy birthday.
Thank you. Uh, oh, well. Happy anniversary, Keith. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. You married your job, is that it? Yeah, 31 years of marriage. <laughs> that, that's a job, all right. That's a tenure. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Everybody have a great evening. Yes, you as well. Bye now.